This is Bishop Gregory Brewer of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida, giving the sermon at St. Timothy's Episcopal Church, Daytona Beach, Florida, September 15, 2013. I know one of the things that the bishop is supposed to say when he steps in the pulpit is to say, it's wonderful to be with you, whether he thinks that way or not. But I want you to know that it is, in fact, wonderful to be with you, and I mean it. I've been looking forward to this occasion for actually quite some time. I had an opportunity to meet with a few of you and to say hello at uh, Father Col Colbert Norville's funeral, and we certainly welcomed Alma this morning. Very glad that you were here with us. And also to meet uh, Eddie Asgood, who was actually a member of a class that I taught at the Institute for Christian Studies, who did, in fact, extraordinarily well. Today, I am encouraged by the scriptures because what it says in a very real way that each one of us, no matter who we are, matters very, very deeply to God. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, no matter other courses that we may have taken in the past in terms of different directions that may not have been particularly pleasing to God, the fact of the matter is, is that you matter to Him and he wants to use you, in fact, no matter what you've done, in his service to give you a purpose far higher, far greater than anything that you could ever imagine. And in fact, to make your life an adventure. As some of you know, I was the rector of Calvary St. George's Episcopal Church in New York City prior to coming here to be the bishop of the Diocese of Central Florida. And one of the tr tremendous legacies that was a part of that church especially St. George's, they were two congregations that had been joined together, was a man by the name of Harry Burley, who in fact was remembered this past week in the Lesser Feasts and Fasts of the Episcopal Church. Harry was a pioneer. He was, in fact, the first black organist, choir master, and soloist ever called to any Episcopal Church in the city of New York. This was back in 1894. He had the schooling, he certainly had the talent. He had every qualification that one could imagine, but no one had ever thought to hire him. And it was the vestry at St. George's Church that made what was at the time an extraordinarily courageous decision to call Harry into that position. In fact, when it was announced, people decided they wanted to leave St. George's, and one of the things that happened was that the vestry stood behind their decision and in fact, one of the members of that vestry turned to the rector and said to him, if anybody <coughs> withdraws their pledge, I will personally make it up. <coughs> this is the right decision and we will move forward. And one of the things that happened as a result of the stage and the platform that God gave Harry, Burley was not just in terms of leading the worship of his congregation, which he did extraordinarily well, besides his gifts as a baritone, which became renowned, as because of that position. But he began to introduce into the lexicon of the musical heritage of a far broader audience that, that had been known in the past, the history of spirituals that most people had in fact never heard. And in fact, he gained international prominence when he met with a young composer from Czechoslovakia who had come to the United States on a fellowship by the name of Antony Dvorak who the two of them met together and many of the tunes that Harry Burley knew wound up being incorporated into a symphony that is now one of the most famous in the world called From the New World or the New World Symphony. God knew that Harry Burley mattered. Regardless of the doors that some people wanted to close, God stepped in and said, what has happened to you, the gift that has been imparted to you, the thing that you can bring to a wider audience, in fact, should not be shut out. That's the story of Paul, the apostle in the Timothy lesson. If you read, if you read the first two lessons, the lesson out of Jeremiah and the lesson of the psalm, it's really very bleak. Jeremiah is prophesying that Israel is going to be sheer desolation because they chose to not follow God's plan for their life as a nation. And God wanted them to see the folly 
of their choices. And therefore, what he said is, in essence, because you're not willing to listen to me, then what I'm going to have to do is bring about some pretty drastic changes in your circumstances. I'm bringing judgment to the nation of Israel. And it's not because I'm, because I'm trying to get back at you. I'm trying to get you to see the folly of your ways in choosing not to follow me. And desolation, in fact, came. In fact, Jeremiah, for his trouble, was actually thrown into the bottom of an empty well. Left to die there, he did not. But that was the plan of his persecutors because they did not want Jeremiah saying to the nation that, what the, political, that the political and religious decisions that the nation had made were wrong. But Jeremiah was faithful. God protected Jeremiah even in the midst of plots to take his life because God had done something in Jeremiah and he did not want that to be lost. The same is true in the psalmist. The psalmist cries... No one is really following after God. In fact, the fools even say there is no God at all. And he's, he prays that God would break in and bring comfort to people who are faithful. If you notice in Jeremiah's story and in Harry Burley's story, being called by God does not necessarily mean living in good circumstances. And in fact, a commitment and a choosing to be faithful to God's purposes can be extraordinarily costly. It is not a guarantee, in other words, of a comfortable life. Instead, it's a call to hardship sometimes. But it is in the hardship that adventure begins to break through. And God begins to use you in places and in ways that you never ever could have imagined for yourself. That's the story of Paul, who really, by his own confession, and it's certainly borne out in the historical record of the book of Acts, was everything that he said he was. Even though I was formally, he says in the Timothy lesson, a blasphemer. In other words, this thing about Jesus and what he has to say, it's not God. This is not God's will. This is not what God is saying. To say that about Jesus is in fact blasphemy. A persecutor, absolutely. His deep commitment, mistakenly believing that that's what God wanted him to do, was to literally remove from the face of the earth by house arrest, by throwing people out of their homes, by making sure that they weren't, they couldn't keep their jobs, from being exiled out of the places of their birth, a persecutor of those who were followers of Jesus. And the last thing he describes himself as is a man of violence. Literally, in the Greek, it means a man of blood. He was not above making sure that these followers of Jesus would be executed for blasphemy, if at all possible. And personally, as we know in the book of Acts, presided on the st over the stoning of Stephen. If there was any person on the planet who could be thought of by his behavior from disqualif being disqualified from the mercy and forgiveness of God, it would have been Rabbi Saul, as he was known at that point. Saying everything about Jesus that they say is dead wrong, and in fact that it would be blasphemy to say so. Routing out and destroying the churches, having Christians killed, executed, and exiled. And yet, what, he, what does he say? And yet I received mercy. Why? He said because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. What he means by that was, it didn't, it didn't mean he didn't know what he was doing. He had the mistaken notion that what he was doing, in fact, was the best course of action. That's how it is with us. One of the alluring aspects of any sin is that we know that it will satisfy some need of ours. And though even though we might know it's wrong, we still do it. Because we think that is, in fact, the best course of action for us to meet that need at the time. And so Paul insists, does not say that if you know that it's the right thing to do and choose not to do it, then at that point you're disqualified. That's not at all what he's saying. If that were true, none of us could be here this morning, right? <laughs> Instead, what he's trying to say is, is that almost always the allure and the attraction of sin blinds us from other choices. 
All we see is the attraction that is right in front of us. And we become convinced in our hearts that that is, in fact, the right thing to do, even if we know that in that moment it is against one of the commandments of God. It's like the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. God was very clear, you don't eat of this fruit, you do eat of that fruit. And yet, they took it and ate it anyway. Why? Because they thought that that would satisfy the need for knowledge and that there was no other way to gain. They were wrong. But you see, they were ignorant of the implications of what was going to happen to them. Even though God had specifically said, if you eat this fruit, you will surely die. Most of us do not know when we are committing sin, the full consequence of our actions. And there are plenty of people who have had terrible consequences happen to them because of bad choices. And the refrain is again and again, oh, if I had only known that's what Paul is describing here when he's describing about acting in ignorance. And yet, even for Paul, as surely is true even for any of us, he says in a way that I think is really quite wonderful, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. In other words, what came my way when I deserved judgment when I should have been wiped off the face of the earth, where I should have been one of those residents in Jerusalem that wound up being taken into Israel, into exile under the prophet Jeremiah, all of that should have been what I deserved. And yet what God gave to me, thank God, was not what I deserved. What he gave me was just sheer mercy. I should have qualified for punishment. But God says, no, I'm not giving you punishment. I'm giving you mercy. I'm giving you forgiveness. That is what he means when he talks about the grace and the love that flows over me that are in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say, this saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world not to condemn, but to save, literally to, look, to deliver, to rescue. To rescue us from the full consequences of all it is that we have done and open instead for us not judgment, but the very gift of eternity. That's, it is that very gift, that ability to say, Almighty God, have mercy on you. If we confess our sins, as it says in 1 John, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The ability to change the interior sense of our own heart. Those things that we cannot ever change about ourselves. God breaking in and giving us mercy where we should have deserved judgment. That is the thing that actually even allows us to be in his presence this morning. If it wasn't for the forgiveness of Jesus, we'd be gathering and we would maybe even hear from heaven. What are you doing here? You shouldn't be here, you know. This is only for the righteous. <laughs> if that were true, then this would be an empty church. The wonder of it is, is that regardless of where we have been, what we have done, we're welcomed by God. We're given the opportunity to confess and receive His forgiveness, to draw near, and to know that, as the Scripture says in Romans, in Christ Jesus there is no condemnation. And in fact, the whole thrust of the gospel reading in the story of the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin is another way that Jesus says that the very thing, same thing that Paul is describing. Because who is the lost sheep? It's one of us. Who is the lost coin? It's one of us. And that it is the shepherd and the woman looking for the lost coin that Jesus is saying, that's what God is doing. He is reaching out through this planet. This planet, in fact, is that is under judgment. He's the one coming out from under that judgment to reach out and to take an individual by the hand and bring that person home to his love, and to his mercy, and to his forgiveness. That's who our God is. Not one who condemns, but instead one who forgives. And with this, I'll close. Not just forgiveness so that we can feel better than we do whatever we want to do. Paul was commissioned in the very forgiveness that he received. So it is with us. 
God doesn't come and bring forgiveness and mercy to you just so that you can feel better, although it really feels quite wonderful. Instead, God gives you such mercy and forgiveness so that you, in turn, can say, God, what would you have me do? To be available for him. To be available for him and for his purposes, regardless of what that might mean, and wherever that might take you. You see, otherwise, forgiveness becomes an excuse just for me to do whatever I want. Oh, I can do whatever I like, and I know God will forgive me, and it will always be okay. That's not what the Scripture teaches. What the Scripture teaches is something quite different. That God comes and brings mercy and forgiveness to anyone, so that in thanksgiving for that mercy, they might be able to say to Him, Here I am, O Lord. What would you have me so that in the very arena where they are placed, whether that be in their family, in their neighborhood, in the businesses where they work, among their friends that they see socially, they would have the courage, because it takes courage, to be available for God and for His purposes wherever they are. See, that's Harry Burley showing the story. He's shown like a light in his generation. Because of the courage that God gave him to be all that God had made him in a way that literally changed the musical face of the city of New York and by extension through Dvorak, literally the world. I can tell story after story like that. No matter where you are, God can in fact use you if you're open to his invitation. And you have inside of you the courage to be able to do it because you know that no matter what happens, God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. The slate is clean. You know that you are forgiven. And therefore, there's no condemnation. There's no need to be afraid. You can step out courageously and do things that other people would go. Why in the world did he or she do that? Because of the power and the grace that God put in you, which is the overflow of the love of our Savior. That's Paul's testimony. That's Harry Burling's testimony. So today, especially as we later commission people into ministry, that I'm really excited about, by the way, I want to say to you that there is a purpose for you, both individually and as members of this congregation. There is a call from God on St. Timothy's Church. There's a call from God on your lives. So please don't just reach out for forgiveness. Reach for purpose. And see what God will do in and through you. Amen. Amen. Amen.